Hello everyone. We've arrived at the third Sunday of Easter when we hear the familiar story of the road to Emmaus. So let us begin with a prayer. Loving God, may your people exalt forever in the renewed youthfulness of spirit, so that rejoicing now in the restored glory of our adoption, we may look forward in confident hope to the rejoicing of the day of the resurrection. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. That very day, the first day of the week, two of the disciples were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus, and they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. As it happened while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped, looking downcast. One of them, named Clophus, said to him in reply, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there these days? And he replied to them, What sort of things? And they said to him, The things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people, how our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it is now the third place that all this, third day since all this took place, and some women of our group, have astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and they did not find his body. They came back and reported that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced he was alive. Then some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had described, but him they did not see. And he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke! Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. And as they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he was going to go on farther. But they urged him, stay with us, for it's nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And it happened that while he was with them at table, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. With that their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. But he vanished from their sight. Then they said to one another, Were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way? and opened the scriptures to us. So they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the eleven and those who were with him, who were saying, The Lord has truly been raised, and he has appeared to Simon. And then the two recounted what had taken place on the way, and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of the Lord. Three years ago, while visiting Poland to give some talks on precious bud spirituality to our missionaries, the provincial of our Polish province took me to Krakow to visit the De Divine Mercy Shrine and also the church built in honor of Pope John Paul II, who was the Archbishop of Krakow when he was elected Pope in 1978. On display in the back of the church is the white cassock that the Pope wore when he was shot at St. Peter's Square on May 13, 1981, in an assassination attempt. It's striking to see the white cassock stained with dried blood. Pope John Paul lost a lot of blood that day, but survived the attack on his life and went on to become one of the longest serving popes in the history of the Catholic Church. He's revered in Poland, of course, not only because he's a native son, but also because he was one of the leading voices in liberating Poland from the Soviet Union. You see his image and statues of him everywhere you go. Seeing that blood-stained cassock 
call to mind the rest of the story. You will recall that Pope John Paul II asked Catholics around the world to pray for the man who tried to kill him. The Pope said he had forgiven the man, Metma Adka. And when he visited Akka in prison, where he was serving a life sentence for attempted murder, while he was in prison, Akka converted to Christianity. Pope John Paul II kept in touch with Akka and his family through the years, and in 2000, the Pope asked the government to pardon him. His request was granted, and Akka was released from prison and sent back to Turkey, where he was from originally. He returned to Rome in December 2014 and placed two dozen white roses on the tomb of Pope John Paul II, whose forgiveness had given him a new lease on life. Today's Gospel reminds us how important it is to remember and tell the stories. These two disciples traveling to Emmaus once followed Jesus with great hope and joy. They truly believed that he would be the one uh, God sent to establish God's reign upon the earth. But now their hearts were broken, and the events that had taken place in Jerusalem, the hope for their future, had died on the cross of Calvary. They thought their time had come and gone, that they missed their finest moment. Even the unbelievable stories of the, the women were telling about the empty tomb were not enough to restore their hope. At that moment in their journey, they couldn't see beyond the pain and the suffering of Jesus' death. They left Jesus in an unmarked grave that they borrowed from a friend and were returning to their former way of life. But on their way back, these two disciples, grief-stricken and out of hope, are joined by a stranger. At first, they're surprised that the stranger doesn't know about all the events that weekend in Jerusalem. What, where, he did, where had he been? In a cave? Well, that's precisely where the stranger had been. And as he begins to make the connections of the weekend events with the tradition these two disciples knew by heart, something begins to stir deep within them. They can't name it yet. But just when the, the, the stranger seems to be going farther, they invite him in to stay with them. This is the turning point in the story. They invite the stranger into their house. They open the doors of their home to the one who they meet along the way, and they offer him a meal. And in offering hospitality, their eyes are opened to his presence in the breaking of the bread. The Emmaus story suggests that on our journey of faith, it's important to trace the stories of our tradition, the traditions, the stories from which we've come. And beginning with Moses, Jesus traces for the disciples on that road to Emmaus the blue highways of holiness found in the stories of our faith. By tracing our tradition, by recalling the stories of faith, we come to know where we've been. We draw upon the wisdom and the courage of those who've gone before us, and we sense a, get a sense of direction for our lives and the courage to find our own way through very difficult and dangerous times in our own journeys of faith. They remind us, these stories, that God is always with us on the journey, leading on, leading us on to sometimes new and unfamiliar territory. In some ways, the Emmaus story might be called On the Road Again, because it captures the pattern of disciples practiced by the followers of Jesus for centuries. That is, until COVID-19 came along, and the shelter-in-place and physical distancing orders caused us to, to force churches and worship spaces to close in order to stop the spread of the disease. And though we can't meet around the altar in our home parishes or worship spaces this Sunday, we can follow the same ritual as the two wanderers who welcome the stranger into their home in the familiar surroundings of their kitchen table. We share the stories of the week. Where do we find hope this week? What were we anxious about? What brought us some joy? What stories did we hear or read in the newspaper that reminded us that when things are at their worst, we human beings are at, at our best. There was a story in the evening news this week, of one of those inf inspirational stories. It concerned a, a military veteran who had lost his job because of the pandemic, and he lined up to receive food for his family. 
but after waiting in line for hours, by the time he reached the place where they were giving out food, they'd ran out of food. So he went to another distribution site and again waited in a long line, but they also ran out of food there. Well, the story highlighted the sheer number of people who are in need today because they've lost their jobs and can't feed their families. In highlighting the frustration and the fear of this man for his family and where their next meal might come from, the next night the news reported how many people opened their hearts and their bank accounts to help this family. They interviewed some of those people and they also interviewed the father and one of his children who were so grateful for the generosity and compassion of others. We need to tell those kinds of stories because they, they give us hope in this difficult time. Then we break open the scriptures. This is what the stranger does in such a powerful way that the two travelers' hearts are on fire, burning within them as they listen to the stories. We make the connections between the stories of scripture and the stories of our lives. And then, like the disciples who invited the story storytelling stranger in for supper, we break the bread. And it's only then that the disciples in today's gospel can name their heartburn, why their hearts were burning within them on the road. It is in the breaking of the bread, an action, reminding them of what Jesus did on the night before he died, that they recognize him and say, it is the Lord. There's a fourth part of the story as well, to go forth and tell others what we've seen and heard along the way. Because of our sheltering in place, we have to find creative ways to share the good news of Jesus Christ and the risen Lord with others. But our challenge remains the same, because as those two disciples go back and tell the others we've seen the Lord and then proceed them, proceed to tell them that they, what they've experienced, so through our emails and our texts and our video chats and our social media, we can share the stories of our lives as people who are redeemed in the blood of Christ. Maybe write a note this week to someone you haven't talked to in a while, a handwritten note, or give them a call. When I saw that bloodstained cassock of Pope John Paul II, my eyes were open to the witness of mercy and forgiveness that he extended to the man who tried to kill him. It's the same mercy Jesus extends to those disciples on the way to Emmaus who abandoned him when, they needed, when he needed them most. It's the same mercy those watching the evening news extended to the veteran and his family. It's the same mercy all those in the front lines of this pandemic are extending to those who are sick and dying, and those who are feeding the hungry and reaching out to those in need. As we gather around our kitchen tables this Sunday to break some bread and share some stories, either in person with our families or communities or on the phone or on social media, may our eyes be opened and our hearts burn with love and hope as we recognize the risen Christ is with us. His presence is right here, and it always will be. Keep safe. Take good care. Have a blessed week. God bless.